everybody, colleagues. Good morning, after, um, afternoon and evening to everybody around the world. Um, excuses for the technical glitches. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you. My name is Gerry Eikemans. Um, I'm a public health expert, medical doctor, and um, heading the area of health promotion and social determinants of health uh, of the Pan American Health Organization and the Regional Office of the World Health Organization. And it's my pleasure to moderate this very important session, this official side event of the high level forum of the Director Generals for um, Development, uh, the, the DG Forum um, for Development Cooperation, sorry, on the role of South South Cooperation and Triangular Cooperation in sustaining public primary health care, um, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health, and universal health coverage in the context of COVID. Um, this forum will provide a platform to follow up on the DG Forum conclusions and identify some uh, strategic uh, actions, and it will contribute um, to ensure the delivery of essential public health functions. Um, um, Really a uh, pleasure, this co-organized meeting between UN OCC, uh, UN OSSC, UNFPA, UNICEF, and PAHO. Um, just a couple of um, practical things. There is translation here, um, English, Spanish, so you can um, um, find the translation option at the bottom of your screen. And um, without further ado, um, I will, um, and it's an absolute honor for me to introduce um, Ab Adel, Abdel Latif, uh, who will give us his opening remarks. He's the UN Office for South-South Cooperation uh, Director at the interim. Adel, adelante, go ahead. Thank you, Jerry, um, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I am pleased to be with you today, uh, dear participants, uh, and dear colleagues. Um, I can say good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, as I see that we have different time zones. So I started from east to west, and as uh, I say, good morning for the Western Hemisphere. Um, yeah, I'm pleased to be able to address you today on this very timely subject, leveraging South-South and Triangular Cooperation COVID-19 response and recovery has been one of the major areas of our work over the last year. Through our work and experiences, particularly via modalities of knowledge sharing, experience sharing, trust fund programs, and capacity building, we could see that South-South and Triangular Cooperation was essential to respond to the crisis, as well as to prepare for building back, back better. I would like to see this opportunity to share several examples of the work that our office has done uh, with you uh, during 2020. In early 2020, uh, our office through South South Galaxy conducted a mapping of health authorities and their responses and efforts to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This mapping provides a repository of efforts in addressing the outbreak and enabled countries to quickly access information. It also included official donation platforms established by governments were available to support crowdfunding efforts. WHO circulated this mapping to the regional offices. Uh, through also the trust funds that uh, our office is managing, namely the India UN Development Partnership Fund, the India, Brazil, and South Africa Facility for Poverty and Hunger Alleviation, IPSA Fund, Riz Guerrero Trust Fund, and the United Nations Fund for South-South Cooperation, were early responders to the COVID-19 pandemic. In-kind support totaling almost 12 million US dollars to 31 countries in the global South was fast tracked to help them respond to COVID-19 through supplying ventilators and personal protective equipment, as well as resources to mitigate socioeconomic impacts. The India UN fund fast COVID-19 response projects in 14 countries in the global South with 90% of funds used for immediate purchases of medical equipment, ambulances, ventilator, respirators, ICU beds, incinerators, and other materials, while 10% of funds were used for economic recovery among the most vulnerable, including women and girls. Through the UN Fund for South-South Cooperation with support from China, over 1.1 million masks, 1,000 medical protectors, and 10 respirators were distributed among 20, 22 countries. 
South South Trust Fund continue to provide support to small island developing states across all geographical regions, 12 seeds in the Caribbean and 13 seeds in the Pacific and four seeds in Africa and Asia. During 2020, 18, nine, 18 UN entities implemented projects supported by the trust fund managed by the UN Office for South-South Cooperation. In addition, through CITES project, uh, the, our office mobilized donations benefiting people in 22 countries, facilitated good practice sharing, and conducted mapping of CITES innovative practices in COVID-19 response. The Global South-South Development Center project network member institutions and partners also made significant donation of funds and medical supplies worth approximately 3.6 US million dollars for COVID-19 responses, benefiting people in more than 20 countries. Example of good practices of leveraging South-South and Triangular Cooperation COVID-19 response and recovery were documented in the third volume of good practices in South-South and Triangular Cooperation for Sustainable Development published in 2020. There was a dedicated chapter on SDG3, Good Health and Wellbeing, which brings together a collection of 30 good practices in COVID-19 response and recovery. To face challenges associated with COVID-19, South-South cooperation and partnership among all stakeholders, be it governmental and non-governmental, and at various levels, local, national, regional, and global, will play a key role to, conf to confront not only the existing challenges, but also emerging issues and likely future crises. I encourage you to use the platforms the, uh, of uh, the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation for sharing knowledge and good practices on South-South and Triangular Cooperation. The three key platforms include South-South Galaxy, South-South Global Thinkers, and, and the Global South-South Development Expo. Uh, I encourage you to continue your engagement with the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation. And finally, I wish you great success in your discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adele. Wonderful for your wonderful words, for giving us this overview. Um, colleagues, today we are going to hear um, a series of experiences uh, from around the world, and it's focused on uh, primary health care and universal health coverage, or as we say in our region, universal access to health and universal health coverage. Um, and we know that although the world was shaken and affected by the pandemic, a certain populations were particularly affected, those in the most vulnerable situation. And it was because of uh, pre-existing conditions, because maybe there were migrants already living in, in poor areas, their social employment conditions, workers in the informal economy had huge challenges. Um, or the living conditions, crowded spaces, urban settlements, etc., or the access to healthcare. All those factors have been really important in how populations, different populations, have experienced COVID. And um, for our region, for the Americas, at the epicenter of the pandemic for most of last year, it's become very clear that we need to pay, pay special attention to those populations and to those territories. And we have, the PARO has put up an equity approach uh, with emphasis on those populations and situations, vulnerability central on our agenda. And the role of South-South collaboration could not be more important on the topic, on discussing this uh, within this context by sharing approaches, experiences, um, particularly uh, during uh, the next phase of building back, maybe not so much uh, back, but building better forward. It's crucial. And the role of our healthcare system and how and our health policies is going to be so important. So thank you so much for this opportunity. We really look forward to hearing from you. So uh, the Q&A is open to everybody for making um, um, comments um, if, and, and questions that hopefully we can discuss at the end of our meeting. As I said earlier, there is interpretation. You can listen to this also in Spanish and the other way around when somebody speaks in Spanish. But um, next, the most important, of course, are our panelists. We have a series of very um, exciting speakers. 
The first one is Dr. Wessam Mangula, uh, who is a healthcare professional with over 11 years of experience in public health, uh, in public health emergency management, epidemiology, practicing medicine. And he has worked for governmental, non-governmental and international organizations. And in 2016, he was selected, uh, selected as one of 10 African public health professionals to support the establishment and operationalization of Africa CDC under African Union Commission. He's currently serving as the lead of Africa um, collaboration with WHO, uh, uh, sorry, of Africa CDC emergency operations. He has established a coalition in collaboration with WHO and US CDC to push the agenda um, and in Africa and support member states. Dr. Wessam Mankula, the floor is yours. You have your eight minutes now, over. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. And uh, we're, we're pleased to be part of this uh, important uh, forum uh, to share also our experience uh, in Africa CDC in uh, fighting against uh, COVID-19 and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on um, primary health care and essential uh, services uh, in Africa. So I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Okay. So um, I'll cover two parts in, in my presentation. The first one is the epidemiological situation of um, COVID-19 in the continent and also its impact on uh, primary healthcare service and essential services. Then I'll share our experience, Africa CDC respond to COVID-19 and the impact in, in this part. Uh, globally, uh, as you know, uh, we have more than 123 million uh, confirmed cases reported worldwide with more than 2.7 million death, uh, reported uh, globally. Uh, most of the cases coming from PAHO region and also from, from Europe. In Africa, the situation so far, we have more than 4 million uh, confirmed cases reported in the continent with more than one 110,000 uh, confirmed deaths and recoveries more than 3.7 million recoveries. In Africa, we experienced uh, the first wave of this pandemic around uh, mid of July, and the second wave of the pandemic around the uh, end of December, beginning of uh, January. Uh, most um, affected region in the continent, we have five regions, the most affected one, Southern African region, followed by uh, North African region. Uh, this map showed uh, an incident of COVID-19. Uh, this is a number of cases per 100 per million population uh, per day. So we have two countries reporting more than 100 cases per 1 million population per day, while three countries reporting between 50 to 100 cases per 1 million population uh, per day. 26 between 5 to 50 cases per 1 million population per day. And for the case fatality rate, we have three countries, more than 5% case fatality rate, while 18 countries uh, around 22 uh, and 5%. Uh, uh, in the continent, we conducted so far more than 39 million tests conducted in the continent with test per case ratio slightly below the recommended ratio from WHO. Uh, the recommended ratio 10 to 30 tests per case ratio. We, ha we have in Africa 9.4 tests per case ratio and positivity rate is 10.6%. Uh, and this map show the tests per case ratio per country. We have uh, 19 countries are, are below the recommended ratio from WHO, 35% higher, 65% of the continent either within the recommended ratio or above the recommended ratio from, from WHO. What is the impact of COVID-19 on essential service? Recently in February this year, uh, Africa CDC in partnership with evidence-based uh, uh, response PERC initiative, we conducted a survey included 19 member states in, in the continent uh, to see the impact of COVID-19 on essential service. So what we found, and this is initial result, and uh, the final report will be published soon in the coming weeks. 42% of the respondents uh, reported uh, that uh, while they are in need of health services, they or uh, someone in their family member, so they are skipped or delayed visit uh, because of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And 43% have difficulties in obtaining uh, medication. Also, the report show uh, that dismissed service were highest among women 
among people aged uh, more than 36 years old among lower income uh, responders uh, as well. Um, and the reason behind missing this service, if you can look at uh, the right side of the screen, you'll find mainly because of fear of catching COVID-19, also because of, uh, and this is 29%, health facility disruption, 22% reported uh, this as one of the reasons behind missing service, also related to cost uh, affordability, 20%, mobility restriction, 20%, Critical responsibility is 5%. Self-isolation with suspected COVID is, is 2%. And uh, the different type of services that missed uh, during this time, it's mainly a routine checkup and preventive service, 33%. Non-communicable disease follow-up, 25%. Uh, diagnostic service and symptom, 25%. Uh, reproductive maternal, neonatal, child health, 17%. Uh, While communicable uh, diseases, uh, like uh, malaria, TB, HIV, 15%, vaccination, 4%, suspected COVID is 2%. Um, and this is uh, furthermore, uh, among households that missed, 17% reported uh, their missing service related to uh, reproductive, maternal, and, and child health. More than 25% of responder attributed missed visit. Uh, this is in Ghana, Mozambique, South Africa, uh, and Zimbabwe. For the economic impact of COVID-19 on essential service, 20% of households that miss service, uh, this is mainly to cost and affordability. Uh, lower income household, they reported a bit uh, higher, 27%, and comparable to uh, higher income household, uh, 15%. Uh, cost as a barrier, uh, was uh, notably high in Cameroon, 35%, Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco, and, and Kenya. And the survey also uh, found that um, missed health visits uh, were much higher among responders that reported that they had lost some of their income, 42%, or lost uh, all of their income, 58%. Uh, and this is incomparable to the, the household that reported there is no loss of income, it's a bit lower, it's 26%. Uh, and the second part is related to our response at Africa CDC uh, in the continent. What have we done so far in the continent to respond to this challenge for COVID-19 and the impact on essential uh, service? We adopted six pronged approach, uh, Africa Joint Continental Strategy, AFCOR Task Force, Africa Task Force for COVID-19, a PACT initiative, Africa Medical Supply Platform, COVID-19 Vaccine Strategy, and Africa Against COVID-19 Saving Lives, Economies, and, and Livelihood. One week after the uh, beginning of this pandemic in the continent, first case reported in Egypt, uh, mid of February, uh, we called Africa CDC and African Union Commission called for emergency ministerial meeting for health minister. Uh, this is to have uh, one position for, for Africa and move together uh, toward addressing this uh, pandemic and the possible impact for, for this pandemic on different aspects of life. Uh, during this um, emergency ministerial meeting, uh, Health Minister uh, endorsed Africa Joint Continental Strategy to move forward together as a continent and endorsed Africa Task Force for COVID-19 as a continental stru structure for collaboration, communication, and coordination be between uh, member states. Also, we work closely with different departments within African Union Commission, like Peace and Security, working with different partners from uh, private sector uh, as well uh, to support the response uh, in the continent. This is structure for AFCO Task Force, Africa Task Force for COVID-19. At the top of the structure, we have uh, African Union chairperson. Uh, we have five president from the continent, one represent each region and also the director of Africa CDC. Uh, then we have three ministerial committee, one for health, one for finance, one for transport. Then we have a continental steering committee. Then we have seven technical working group, each one focus on a technical area. Through this structure, we have instant management structure within Africa CEC to implement the guidance that we are getting from uh, AFCOR task force. Um, and quickly within the first two to three weeks after first case reported in, in the continent, uh, we managed to conduct training in 21 countries to enhance the surveillance system. And this is not only include 
representative from health ministry, but also from point of entry and also from biggest airline companies. Early at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, January, none of African countries, they have the capacity to do lab testing. Uh, early February, only two countries, then Africa CDC managed to conduct training for 43 countries within two to three weeks uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. Currently, all the 55 countries, they have the capacity to conduct COVID-19 uh, testing. The same IPC training for 23 countries in the first two to three weeks, risk communication and clinical care management, 25 countries uh, were engaged. Also, uh, we have noticed around June that uh, there is a huge impact on the continuation of essential service. This is when Africa CSU also launched its guidance and strategy for continuation of essential service for, for uh, member state. And it focused on um, uh, a quiet number of, of pillars. Uh, one focus on having governance uh, at continental level and also at country level uh, for accountability and coordination framework to ensure continuation of essential service. In addition to identify what is essential uh, service uh, to be prioritized to address and uh, because of it may have impact because of COVID-19. Also maximize the use of available health service delivery option in addition to establish effective screening, triage, and safety for health workers. Also redistributing a healthcare workforce capacity, staff from an unaffected area, engagement of retired staff, accelerating training for medical student, nursing, and health staff. Uh, in addition to ensuring continuous availability of essential medication equipment uh, and supplies and including also message about continuity of essential service uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. So far we managed uh, as Africa CDC to conduct training for almost all, all the member states using different platform, either in-person training, webinars, and, and virtual training, and numbers on, on the left side, including different technical area for laboratory, uh, surveillance, IPC, risk communication, case management, and public health emergency operation center. This is to ensure that continue to of operation controlling the, the pandemic. Uh, in addition to providing different uh, lab test kits and IPC supplies and, and medical equipment, we provided out of the uh, 39 million tests conducted in the continent, around 7.5 million tests provided by Africa CDC, 12 million masks. We currently support also uh, 20 countries with uh, 25 genome sequencing e equipment to ensure that this kind of uh, equipment and uh, this kind of capacity available in the continent, in addition to protective suit, disinfectant, infrared ther thermometer as well, dexamethasone and ventilators. Uh, this is also our um, uh, rapid response team that deployed this map on the left side, showing our rapid response team that deployed to support member state. We have more than 200 uh, responders deployed uh, to, to the member state to, to support the continuation of um, essential service and, and operation during COVID-19. In addition to uh, around 16,000 community health workers uh, to, to support uh, member states in contact tracing and raising the awareness of, of the community and also will be used during the vaccination uh, campaign. Uh, another initiative that, that we launched uh, around April it's packed initiative partnership for accelerating COVID-19 testing. This is to, to ensure increase the number of tests to be conducted in the continent and also deployment of community health worker to support uh, contact tracing in the continent. Uh, also because it's important to balance between uh, saving lives and livelihood and opening the economy. This is why we launched uh, around August uh, Africa Against COVID-19 initiative saving lives, economies, and livelihood. Under this initiative, we have three main pillars, one for protecting borders and travels, another one for protecting economies and livelihood, in addition to uh, schools, uh, to, to return back to, to schools. Okay, uh, one finally, moment, yeah, okay, good. Okay. Finally, it's the vaccine. Uh, toward the, the end of the year, uh, last year, so we have this COVID-19 vaccine strategy because vaccine one will be one of the key a pillar to control this pandemic and help us in returning back to a normal life. So uh, we have three main pillars. One focus on clinical trials uh, to be conducted in the continent for, for this vaccine. Also having access to this 
uh, vaccine and having uh, regulation. Uh, so we're targeting to have 1.5 billion uh, dose to be available in the continent to cover 60 percent uh, uh, in the continent and this is will cost us between 10 to 15 billion uh, so far uh, we launched avat african vaccine acquisition task team under the previous chair of african union president ramaphosa and we succeeded to secure 270 million uh, dose to be available in the continent and 400 additional million uh, under active negotiation to hit the target of, of 60 percent so this is in brief our effort as africa cdc to address uh, this issue and help in uh, continuation of essential service in, in the continent over to you thank, thank you. you so much dr mancula very very interesting presentation highlighting the enormous impact not only of COVID but also of people not being able to access their essential services um, and the other impacts, as we all know, the economic, social um, impacts and how this being balanced and how primary healthcare plays such an important role. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so we're going now to our next speaker, uh, which is um, from the region of the Americas, Dr. Luis Gonzalez Machado, uh, who is currently the Director General of the National Health Board uh, of Uruguay, an independent body within the Ministry of Health. Dr. Gon uh, Gonzalez Machado has coordinated health strengthening and modernization programs um, within the Ministry of Health of Uruguay in collaboration with the Inter-American Inter Development Bank. He, has also, he also works uh, in the development of the implementation of social policies with the UNDP, UNICEF, and ILO. He's a medical doctor specialized in radiotherapy from the University of uh, the Universidad de la República in Uruguay. Dr. Uh, Luis González Machado, adelante. Tiene sus ocho minutos. Gracias. Buenos días. Saludos a todos los eh, panelistas y a todos los, los participantes en esta... Good morning. I want to welcome all the participants. My presentation will focus on conceptual components, and I thank uh, Dr. Bankula for describing the situation in Africa. I'd like to highlight that in Uruguay, we don't have pandemic expertise. Uruguay, fortunately, has not been the subject of this type of catastrophe. And therefore, we, we have had to develop a very concise strategy in a very rapid way to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic as a systemic problem, a global, regional, and national problem that exceeds the scope and the competencies of our health sector. It's up to us to maximize the response to the pandemic by the health system within the framework of responding to the emergency. We need to manage the response to the pandemic. And we need to establish the need for a permanent relationship between the health system, society, and the economy. The strategy employed by Uruguay has won or has been one of driving leadership at the highest level with a very practical focus that is also very broad with the participation of various organizations both social and political from the entire country all of this focused on a great deal of capacity for resolution and with a very executive approach this strategic approach with high level leadership has been led by the president of the, our nation and the minister of health, President Akaya and Minister Salinas. It's been a joint effort that has also been involving different scientific advisors, advisors at the highest national level that have not only provided a, an excellent quality to the response, but have also garnered a great deal of credibility in society given that our main scientists in country in the health sector have been involved and we have the best scientists with the best expertise working with the leadership at the national level to develop practical solutions one important component of this strategy has been innovation 
One example of this innovation has been the development of production capacity in Uruguay regarding production techniques to develop molecular diagnostic tests, uh, PCR. Innova Uruguay is a very innovative country. And when we applied the uh, Tetris uh, strategy of tracing and isolation, we ran into the difficulty of not having more than just a few dozen tests in country to be able to conduct these studies. We also saw a tremendous scarcity of these at the global level. And because of Uruguay's small economic capacity, we didn't have access to certain markets uh, for the purchase of these resources or equipment or respirators. And therefore, we engaged in a quick initiative that allowed us to establish an agreement between the academic sector as well as the scientific national sector, the Pasteur Institute, and other key research organizations and our Ministry of Health, where we were able to develop a national Uruguayan test to be able to conduct COVID-19 di diagnostics using highly effective biomolecular technology. And our national industry subsequently was able to produce a large number of tests that afforded us the opportunity to engage in mass testing campaigns by using these biomolecular techniques. And this was very effective in addressing the needs of the population. Today, more than 35% of the nation's population has been subjected to this biomolecular diagnostic test. So this was a rapid innovation and application that went beyond the traditional difficulties that we've seen when we have academia coordinate the efforts with the private sector. Now, this was supported by greater participation and communication. As we stated, we had a, a lot of stakeholders involved. As I stated previously, we didn't have any expert on pandemics, so we had to listen to the experts, but we also needed to make some quick decisions. Uruguay is broken down into 19 different states, and in each state, we created an emergency commission made up of uh, local government representatives and different health uh, officials, labor organizations, civil society, with a very clear objective. The idea wasn't to have theoretical discussions, but rather come up with quick decisions. And the national government and the Ministry of Health took part in these uh, deliberations, and we were able to make uh, generalized decisions that we could put into practice and adapt and adopt in each state by each one of these state commissions. The communication strategy is and continues to be an essential element for us to be able to properly align all of society's activities in this regard. The appearance and the impact of the pandemic has affected all the levels of society and as it typically happens, the most vulnerable people are typically the most gravely affected. The way in which we aligned all of the affected sectors in society and the way in which we intervened with social organizations, political, scientific organizations, non-government organizations, through a leadership campaign, we engaged in various different communication activities. Our president was having press conferences uh, practically on a daily basis, and these were then uh, less frequent over time. So clearly the pandemic is a problem that affects the health system, but the health system by itself isn't sufficient to 
bring about the necessary economic responses as well as other changes to try and face the pandemic and its impacts in an effective way. So what has been the approach for our health system specifically as it is geared for towards controlling the epidemic? We decided that we needed to have an effective system of health in Uruguay. We needed to create a unified financing mechanism to ensure universal coverage to all of the citizens in our country through an integrated health care plan and a portfolio of offerings that includes prevention services, health care services, rehabilitation, and other types of services. This has been something that has been undergoing in our country for a number of decades. And in our response to the pandemic, we have seen this system put to the test, but we've also seen a strengthening of our national health system, much of which includes private sector providers, medical professional organizations, and other key public officials, including organizations such as state health or organizations, our social security system, everything under the umbrella of the National Health System Authority, which involved our division directly in this situation, and that also has two other government agencies. And this degree of governance is very important. On the one hand, we have the National Council on Health, which is the organization that provides coverage to current, uh, currently employed people, retired people. And on the other hand, we have the other council that covers the needs of different populations, including military, low income families, law enforcement, but everything is geared towards a unified health policy that includes national and general coverage criteria. This function derived from the national health system has been one of the keys that has allowed Uruguay to provide an effective response to the impact of the pandemic. Now, I need to qualify this by saying that this has been the case so far. It's also worth noting that the Evol evolution of the pandemic has been very dynamic with different scenarios, different phases. One first uh, phase during the month of March. On March 13, we declared the national health emergency. And on the same day, we detected the first four cases in our country. And so our executive branch, our president, uh, called for a national health emergency. And two days after that, we were already undertaking a series of measures that were debated, that were clearly very innovative and bold because our objective was to contain the virus and try to isolate it to our health system. And so we wanted to keep this outside of the uh, population and we wanted to isolate this as effectively as possible. For this purpose, it was important for us to avail ourselves of our resources that Uruguay has nationwide, where we provide in-home services. We can also provide coverage through different mobile units. We have medical staff that can visit patients uh, in their home and provide services, not just in clinics or medical facilities, but provide services in the home. And this allowed us to respond to the first phase of the epidemic without having to have uh, the affected parties uh, go directly into the health system, but rather receive attention from these mobile units. So for this purpose, we also had to enable innovative techniques to be able to address the needs at that time it was considered a huge sin to prescribe medication to a patient via telephone or via some other non-personal contact, but we started using telemedicine extensively 
and we developed a number of new techniques that were based on different platforms, video conferencing, teleconsultation platforms. And to our great surprise, we had a great response by the general population. The response by our medical staff was exemplary and the results were excellent. We then had to face the challenge of having little in the way of resources and trying to parse them out and allocate them in a necessary way to be able to expand our capacity for telemedicine, intensive therapies, for example, and then conduct a proper equitable distribution at a national level. When everything appeared to be under control, we saw a scarcity of medication, which led to another crisis. So in all of these efforts, we've been able to confirm that just as it happens in life, it's good to have good friends. And so in this regard, the country to country collaboration mechanisms, the support that we received from different international organizations, PAHO, the IDB and other organizations provided excellent support to Uruguay so we could engage in rapid and effective responses in the face of this crisis that was affecting all of our governments and all of our nations. We are still managing some of the support that we started more than a year ago, working with a number of associations and organizations that um, have been supporting our efforts. And in some of our communications with other countries and the lessons learned, we've been able to receive knowledge and share knowledge with a number of collaborators on the global level, specifically with the Chilean government, learning from their experiences and their vaccination efforts, which we are now using the vaccine that they used in Chile in our own nation in Uruguay. We've had a dialogue with the government in Japan and other governments uh, all over the world trying to learn from their experiences. We have benefited enormously from the experiences in Japan and Korea who have had stellar results. We're trying to conduct the proper benchmarking based on the experiences of others. And we've been able to support and advise other of our sister nations to be able to come up with a more appropriate response to their issues. As Mac Dr. Makula was saying, now we see the vaccination phase and Uruguay began with the vaccination effort. And we also tried to be very innovative in this regard as well. We developed the vaccination plan that was rigorous, efficient, and widespread throughout the nation. And we had a wonderful plan for conducting the vac vaccination, but we didn't have the vaccine. So we subsequently procured the necessary vaccines and undertook this vaccination program that we believe by the end of this month will allow us to have close to 20% of the entire population of the country vaccinated with an expectation of being able to complete the vaccination of 60% of the total population within three months. Therefore, we have learned when we compare this perhaps to a tennis match or a soccer match or whatever sport you like the best, when we talk about soccer terms, the game has a duration of 90 minutes and Uruguay has been successfully controlling the pandemic during the first 11 months of the year, the year that ends during the mar month of March. Nevertheless, we've seen a sustained rate of growth in the number of infections. Uh, we've also seen an increase in the appearance of different uh, strains and variants. We are starting to see the appearance of different variants of COVID-19 in different parts of our country. And these are more severe and more harmful strains. And so we've seen a spike in the number of cases, and this has increased uh, the concern and the various levels of leadership. We are gravely concerned about this, and we have engaged in new efforts to try and develop the necessary capacity to address this issue. So until we have 60 or 70% of our total population vaccinated, 
we won't be able to confidently say that we are controlling the pandemic. We were able to do so for 11 months, but in this last month, we're starting to lose our grasp of that possibility. And now we need to look at all of these factors because at the same time that we are progressing with our vaccination program, we are still seeing a significant increase in the number of infections. So at this time, leadership is essential. As government officials, as directors of national health systems, we need to engage in all of the necessary efforts to ensure an effective and rapid response. We also need to ensure that civil society maintains its contact with us, that we keep them informed about all of our activities. Thank you very much. Um, talking about things that many countries experience now. We all had to become experts uh, when there were no experts because we had to. Uh, innovation um, as an important point, uh, things we thought we wouldn't be doing now suddenly are, and the opportunity of COVID is also there. And also the point that despite strong leadership, despite the credibility, despite having a great health system, it's still a very difficult battle, and 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 just the introduction of a new um, a new uh, a um, virus a variant can change to the entire game. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are now going to uh, the next presentation uh, from Dr. Abib Gedira. Um, Dr. Gedira is um, the President Director General, the CEO of the Tunisian National Office for Family and Population. He is also a professor for pulmonology at the Medical Faculty of Tunis and a member of the National Science Committee on COVID-19. In the international setting, Dr. Gedira represents Tunisia as a board secretary of the Partners in Population and Development, a 27 member ministerial level intergovernmental body. Dr. Abib Gedira, the floor is yours for eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this introduction. Distinguished guests, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored by this opportunity to participate in this high level forum of the Directors General for Development Cooperation. As you know, policies and convention Tunisia has been adopted for more than 20 years reflect the importance we attach to sharing and exchanging with the countries of the South, our successful experiences, given the social cultural similarities that characterize our societies and the challenges we face. We have to rise together. With this in mind, I firmly believe that South-South cooperation as a strategy for economic and social progress organized by our development partners and their policies for overseas development assistance is essential in generating both new ideas and concrete projects, as well as in sharing experiences, lessons, lessons learned and knowledge on a multitude of strategies and mitigated measures adapted. Before switching to talk about, about our collaborative experience in the context of COVID-19, Please allow me to quickly put into context my words as the head of the Tunisian National Board for Family and Population, mostly known by its French acronym, which is ONFP. The ONFP is a state actor, and our duty is to perform towards national health and social objectives and indicators, mainly in the era of sexual, or the area of sexual and reproductive health and to promote young people positive and healthy behaviors. Our budget is mainly provided by the government, but we perform efficiently with a strong partnership with UN agencies, mainly the UNFPA and the WHO, and also with the Global Fund to fight against the AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, and the South-South Initiative of Partners and Population Development, PPD. Active in the 24th region, uh, region of Tunisia, our staff is among the most qualified for the objectives and include physicians, midwives, nurses, psychologists, and educators working in situ and outreach. Since its establishment in 1973, the UNFP accumulated many success stories, mainly in sexual and reproductive health, 
initially the main objective was to control democratic growth which was hatched in the beginning which was the main objective during the first two decades and by improving the sexual and reproductive health rights and young people health behavior since then our silent indicator is with regard to unmet needs for family planning which reached in 2010 a value as low as 7% in Tunisia. As you know, in, two, uh, in, uh, tw in uh, 2011, Tunisia faced a significant revolution, not in terms of casualties, but significance was in terms of remodeling, remodeling of the direction of the country towards improved democratic interaction, freedom and human rights environment. On the other hand, soaring unemployment rates economic difficulties, deterioration of public services, and religious radicalism created a huge challenge to face, especially for UNFP. For our indicator of preference for sexual and reproductive health, and met need for planning, family, family planning jumped from 7% in 2010 to 19% in 2018 as reported by two consecutive important surveys of multiple indicator cluster survey called MIX. It's with this context of fighting to reverse this negative trends that COVID-19 came to over-challenge our country. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated lives and, life, and livelihoods around the world. It constitutes a great risk to developing countries as well as to vulnerable individuals and groups for women, victims of gender-based violence, people of, with HIV, migrants, and refugees. Tunisia went through three main COVID-19 periods. The first case of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID was reported in early March 2020, and Tunisia decided to implement early measures with lockdown and border closing. This resulted in a very limited outbreak with around 1,000 cases and 50 deaths for 11 million population. And quite three months later, zero cases per, per day. It was very uh, interesting. And also we had, because of lockdown, a drop in 20% of economic performance indicators. During that period, in terms of sexual and reproductive health, despite the exclusion of health services from lockdown, an important negative impact on services and indicators of reproductive and sexual health were reported. Available data sources, UNFP, also from uh, Association of Midwives and a group, Tawhid al uh, UNFP also, show that substantial decrease of activities in UNFP and in ministry dispensaries of all SRS. Uh, sexual and reproductive health activities, namely contraception, pre- and postnatal care, sexual transmission uh, to infection management, breast and cervical cancer, screen, and as well as decrease in information and education and communication, counseling and adolescent and young people directed services. Some centers closed for a period of four to six weeks. The main two reasons for this dramatic impact and for providing the necessary information and the equipment and means for staff protection. After this first period, Tunisia government undertook a review of its programs to take into account the immediate needs to address the fallout, the, uh, fallout of the ongoing pandemic. On April 24, 2020, the Ministry of Health issued circular number 23-2020, instructing to resume public and private sector care activities for non-COVID-19 patients, so to continue our activity out of the way of COVID. In this context, a joint communication strategy involving the Ministry of Health and UN agencies was developed to raise awareness among the general population about the importance of the continuity of essential health services. Among the essential health services to be provided, the circular seat maternal, neonatal, and child health, sexual and reproductive health, prenatal and postnatal services, essential obstetric and neonatal care, 
the head of women of productive age, access to contraceptive methods, including emergency contraception, voluntary termination of pregnancy, including medical abortion and management of sexually transmitted infection. This period was followed by a progressive and controlled developing of borders from 27th of June onwards and managed on the basis of COVID-19 epidemic status in the countries of arrival. The second period lasted two months from 27th June, during which, despite the opening of the borders, few cases were reported thanks to parallel measures, which consist of required PCR for all people arriving from countries classified as orange or red in terms of outbreak activity, but also a lockdown in dedicated center for people arriving from red countries and in COVID-19 center for PCR positive persons. By summer, the relative comfort in the outbreak situation allowed us to prepare ourselves and our human resources through better education and communication, efficient standard procedure, operating procedure and distribution of protective equipment. But another challenge was to raise is to cover the unplanned emergent costs at the same time as the regular time consuming public administrative procedure. And if we go through administrative procedure, it can be very slow. This challenge, nevertheless, was quickly met thanks to the support of the Ministry of Health, to which UNFP reports, and the strong partnership we had we were able to reinstall usual activities with minimal impact of COVID-19 on contamination rates among personnel and to ensure the access to productive equipment measures and the support of the personnel. During the third period of COVID-19 that followed and despite unprecedented global pandemic the world has faced, the National Board of Family and Population continued it, uh, to, uh, su to support its various central and regional sector to ensure the continuity and monitoring of the achievement of its activity and commitments. I would like to refer specifically to the use of communication technology to reach one of our important target group, adolescent and young people, because the, we, we think that was these people who were transmitting to other person the virus. And so we established web and smartphone based educational mobile application on sexual, because to continue our services called Sexo Santé. And also we had two uh, application that provide people adolescent with an, uh, reliable information approved by experts on the field. An important challenge Tunisia faced during this outbreak is was the risky behavior of these young people. And to address this, UNFP uh, launched a campaign to raise awareness among youth and children in educational institutions about how to protect themselves from COVID-19 and the impact they can have on older and elderly patients, uh, parents. This campaign raised, uh, lasted 10 days and involved all of the 24 government rights structures. UNFP has also Leverage the new digital technologies such as video conferencing, webinar, and virtual workshops to ensure business continuity and commitment. This initiative was recognized by independent surveys as one of the best mediated measures to fully recover sexual and reproductive health services in public structure by comparing the situation during the first and second waves of uh, waves of COVID-19 outbreak. Today, we have to to, to uh, a new challenge, we have to face a new challenge with the beginning of the vaccination. The vaccination now we are in 2000 or 3000 person who received mainly from health personnel and all people. But at the same time, we have stock coming, but at the same time, people are questioning about the need of this vaccination, the risk of the vaccination. And the NFP is really to support the government and the Ministry of Health to convince people to increase awareness about vaccination. Ladies and gentlemen, before concluding my speech, I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate Tunisia resolute commitment to support the initiative of South-South and Triangular Cooperation to support the achievement of sustainable development goals and the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. I reiterate our willingness 
to host events to facilitate the exchange of South South countries, best practice of uh, term of resilience in time of crisis, and in addressing health uh, needs and most for mainly for most vulnerable groups, especially migrants and refugees. It's not the last crisis the world will face, but our countries can get better preparedness. Together, let us coordinate our action in order to multiply the success of development in the world of the South, to share them largely through enhanced cooperation, initiating a strong recovery and achieving sustainable development goals by 2030. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Gedira, for your very interesting presentation on um, what happened in Tunisia, um, the, the steps you took, um, the difficulties, again, that countries that your country faced uh, with maintaining sexual reproductive health uh, services um, and, and how important it has been um, to work with communication tools, with new tools, again, innovation, um, very important coming out here, and the challenges that all countries have with vaccination who will get the vaccine first? Do we have enough vaccination uh, vaccines uh, for the ones we need to protect first? And um, dealing with the vaccine hesitancy, which is a, a huge issue also uh, across the world. And thank you also for your call of action, call for action on the importance of cooperation between countries and learning from each other. Thank you very much, Dr. Abib Gedira. Um, so we move now to our next speaker, um, which is. Mr. Uh, um, are you going to forgive me if I don't do this correctly? Mr. Watanawit uh, Gayaseni, uh, who is the Deputy Director General, currently acting uh, for the De uh, Director General of the Thailand International Cooperation Agency, TICA, uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. He has a long career with TICA um, since when um, it was known um, as the Department for Technical and Economic uh, Cooperation, starting as a program officer in 1989. Uh, he must have started when he was five years old, I guess. He has experience working on inter-regional and regional projects and on country uh, partnership, bilateral and trilateral. And he has served as director for countries partnership branch in 2011 and director of partnership for development bureau in 2017. In 2020, he was promoted as the agency's deputy director general. Um, Dr. Uh, Gayaseni, the floor is yours for the next eight minutes. Thank you so much. We are not hearing you, seeing you. Thank you, the moderator. On behalf of Thailand International Cooperation Agency or TAIGA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we thank UNICEF, UNFPA, UNOS, the British OPAHO for the opportunity to speak on the role of development agencies from the South to advance SDG3 and our experiences on EMTCT. South South Thai and Thangla Corporation has been a cornerstone for Thailand's development cooperation and has served to strengthen our capacities as a knowledge hub in the areas where it has expertise, including public health sector. Most of our cooperation on public health focus on epidemiology, primary health care, especially on mother and child health, the promotion of universal health coverage, or USC, and emergency medicine. The aim is to work along our partners to improve their preparedness and respond for any emerging diseases, and to ensure prompt public health measures in place, as well as to share knowledge and lesson learned from the frontline management, clinical, and patient care. With the recent pandemic of COVID-19, we as a development cooperation agency has been put to test how countries can help each other in times of health emergency and make do of what we have to provide the most effective, available, and timely response to the pandemic. From the experience of Thailand, there are a few key lessons that Taika as Development Cooperation Agency learn as we do South SSTRT South South Cooperation in supporting good health and well-being. Firstly, the saying think globally 
act locally does apply to development cooperation. Many of the international practice and universal policy standards and platforms are available for countries to learn from one another. However, at the end of the day, it is how the local capacity to absorb know-how and technology that matters. Absorptive capacity relies on many development elements ranging from the country infrastructure, government structure to sectoral comp component. Example is on how Thailand shares its known good practices on universal health coverage. Before getting to where we are now, it requires whole of government and whole of society approach, taking into account the country's governmental structure, systematic financial management, and demographic divisions. The, the benefit of from our GST system may not necessarily be at a fancy level, but it has the widest coverage and access to as many pockets of population as possible. We apply this approach to development cooperation project we have with other countries. The example is the case of bilateral and ongoing technical cooperation project on USC between Thailand and Kenya, with focus on supporting Kenya's journey to achieve USC. The project touched upon various areas, including financing and prioritizing benefit packets, health technology assessment, or HTA, and human resource development. Special emphasis is on human resources development, as we believe that the key success to effective management of USC relies on having key people who understand important issues that will help achieving USC goal. According to the project work plan in August this year, Thailand will welcome three candidates from Kenya to pursue postgraduate studies in HTA at Mahidol University. Secondly, it is important to take advantage of challenges and crises and turn them into a unique set of knowledge. Fact is, developing countries often face budgetary constraints. Fact is that you also do not need state-of-the-art technology to provide people with primary health care. Fact is, sustainability can simply rely on how we manage knowledge and know-how available. It needs knowledge management and to be systemized for the necessary use in the future by all concerned. In the context of COVID-19, Taika has been engaging in a project which our neighboring countries on strengthening their preparedness in response to COVID-19. A series of simple medical consultation using IT communication with doc doctors from both central and local hospitals between sister hospitals along the border can help providing the right clinical care and guidelines for COVID-19 patients including critical patients and those who complications such as pregnant and newborns. It is also important to realize early detection that will prevent rapid spread of COVID-19. Thailand sets up and provides a RT-PCR laboratory equipment package with SARS-CoV-2 test kits that is at one tenth of the cost of a laboratory in some country which can still do the work needed as effectively and easily set up for emergency response. Thirdly, the emphasis on participatory process never gets old. Encouraging people participation has been the key to ensure the success and sustainability of an, any development cooperation projects. Take an example of village health volunteers in Thailand most evident during the early days response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, taking into the account of the presence of large migrant communities in various provinces of Thailand, we also have, have migrant health volunteers to proactively promote COVID-19 and other health-related awareness among migrant communities in Thailand. We strongly believe with their active participation in this process, we will help mitigate risk factors and reduce spread in the communities as well as in the country. Fourthly, and this is what we learned from engaging in EMTCT of HIV and syphilis project with UNICEF and in maternal health with UNFPA, is an in order to scale up the efforts of SSC systematic partnership is very really important. Thailand through Taika and the Thai Ministry of Public Health or OPH enter into a formal partnership with UNICEF 
with an aim to share our experience in the validation of EMTCT of HIV and syphilis in a more systematic manner. It is to support and facilitate partner countries' access to Thailand's experience, knowledge and expertise in EMTCT, and we do this better with UNICEF co-support. EMTCT validation, capacity building workshop, and field visits were held for several partner countries bilaterally and multilaterally, and was done in a way that we were are able to collect feedbacks in a short and long-term manner for us to be able to reinforce local capacity to ensure effective delivery and strengthening health system and social protection programs in the long run. Taika has also been a long-standing partner with UNFPA in sharing Thailand's experience and sexual and on sexual and reproductive health. This partnership has taken us to now focus on how to evaluate and effectiveness in and the impact of the project in a way that the public is able to understand. We recently engaged in the assessment based on the social return of investment on UNFPA Taika project in Lao PDR or national midwifery education program which shows the return of $4 to $1 invested. We will do more to ensure, to ensure an accountability on the part of the government agency and likewise with the body such as the United Nations. Taika has also collaborated with other development partners such as Taika. Taika in building and strengthening capacity in the area of public health through the implementation of technical cooperation projects and third country training programs. The issue that comes central to our focus now are disaster health management, elderly care, disability care, and user health coverage. In conclusion, development cooperation agency play a key role to facilitate international development cooperation with the most practical, applicable, and sustainable solution based on the good management of resources and expertise of SSC provider and recipients. Emphasis, emphasize also that whether you are providers or recipients of SSC, it is always a two-way learning process. I thank you. Thank you for this um, very interesting intervention um, from Thailand, um, Dr. Uh, Gayaseni. Um, and thank you for highlighting the important role that um, the, the International Development Corporation plays, um, particularly in times like this, and also um, that the crisis do present an opportunity, but that, that how we cash in on that opportunity really depends on how things were before the crisis hit us. And I think that is also a very important lesson and, and what's the uptake of a country and of the local level um, of um, the, the support um, and, and that, that, um, that it gets. So thank you so much um, for um, the intervention um, of Thailand. And now we're going to move um, to our last speaker before um, having some um, closing remarks in the end. Um, so Mr. Um, Anir Chaudhuri uh, is a policy advisor of the A2I program of the ICT division of the cabinet division of the government of Bangladesh supported by the UNDP. In his capacity, he leads uh, the formation of a whole of society innovation ecosystem in Bangladesh to massive technology development, extensive capacity development, integrated policy formulation, a uh, whole of government uh, institutional reform and an innovation fund. His work on innovation and public service has developed interesting and re uh, replicable models of service delivery and decentralization public-private partnerships and the transformation of a traditional bureaucracy into a forward-looking citizen-centric service provider. Very much looking forward to your intervention, Mr. Chaudhuri. The floor is yours for the next eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. That seems to be the standard greeting these days as we are all over the world, uh, <clears throat> talking to each other and interacting and debating. Uh, I'll talk about uh, digital health responses from Bangladesh and how we have shared this uh, through South-South Galaxy, uh, the, the very prominent uh, 
a platform that UN OSSC has launched that uh, Mr. Abdul Latif talked about at the very beginning. Uh, <clears throat> at the uh, very outset, let me also mention a network that we helped uh, catalyze uh, across 39 countries now. Uh, it was proposed by Honorable Prime Minister at the UN General Assembly in 2016, and it was launched in 2017 UN OSSC Global South Sudan Development Expo in Turkey. Uh, so that has really helped us understand what other countries are doing in the region and other, other regions of the world, uh, managing the pandemic, both from a health and livelihood perspectives, and how we have actually incorporated lessons from other countries, and we have shared our own lessons. So let me talk about a few key lessons that we have learned in the last uh, 12 months or so. The South-South Network for Public Service Innovation, which focuses on innovations in data and public service delivery. Uh, we've had uh, a number of initiatives in the last couple of years. Uh, during pandemic, uh, the field visits were not possible, but we have continued to hold webinars and matchmaking workshops, and 17 initiatives have been replicated. Some of them actually are related to COVID. Uh, uh, in the last few months, we also published a number of uh, good practices from Bangladesh uh, for incorporation adoption by other countries uh, in the South-South Galaxy platform. The platform has been incredibly helpful, as I mentioned, to acquire knowledge from other countries and also disseminate knowledge from Bangladesh. Let me talk about a few best practices uh, from Bangladesh that may be helpful. Uh, the first one is a COVID-19 collective intelligence system. Uh, at the very outset, in March and April of last year, we found that we only had one RT-PCR lab in a country of 165 million people. So we needed to find out alternatives using technology so that we could identify high-risk cases and hot zones and do proper resource allocation and do proper timely uh, policy response. So uh, what emerged was a collective intelligence system where we repurposed our triple T hotline, which was a national information hotline, not related to COVID or even uh, medical issues. It was just an information hotline for land records and passports and all kinds of other things. So we repurposed it for medical purposes and allowed people to do self-reporting. And a lot of self-reports came in and using an uh, artificial intelligence backbone, which we worked out with our four telcos, our telecommunications companies, uh, we were able to detect where the disease was spreading the fastest. And uh, over time, we actually brought in uh, different types of data sources from all the different labs. Now we have over, over 100 uh, PCR labs across the country. So all the lab reports were coming in. Uh, and we did an intelligent data analytics and published this information in three different types of dashboard. One for the health providers, the Director General of Health Services, one for the General Administration, Cabinet, and field administration, administration and police, and another for just general public, corona.gov.bd, which became the information hub for the entire uh, population. So as far as self-reporting was concerned, we so far have about 21 million self-reports that have come in that have allowed us to uh, very quickly hone in on exactly where the disease was spreading the fastest. Now it's getting uh, useful again. It was very useful in the first few months of the pandemic when we did not have enough RT-PCR labs. We were able to identify seven to ten days ahead of time where the disease was progressing even before testing. Now again, as the disease is picking up, uh, we are seeing in the last three weeks a uh, very high uptick across the entire country. So this system again is getting uh, very useful. Uh, we used a similar system for predicting where the uh, hospital intervention and ICU intervention ventilators would be necessary. So this kind of data analytics really helped us plan better. Uh, we also used a lot of GIS mapping tools uh, to do local lockdowns. We did about uh, seven weeks of general lockdown in the entire country, but that was very detrimental to our economic activity. So then we started doing small specific local lockdowns based on all the data from different locations of the country, specifically in the capital city, which is where we have about 22 million people. The next best practice I'll talk about is an Uber doctor school. Uh, as people were doing self-reporting in our triple three hotline, 
they also wanted to talk to doctors and get doctor's consultation advice. Uh, so over a period of uh, three weeks, we had about 4,000 plus doctors joining this line, providing uh, free consultation. And this continued for a number of months. It's still continuing right now. Uh, so we have served about 435,000 patients over this uh, medical hotline uh, with uh, free doctor's consultation. And thousands of e-prescriptions were also uh, delivered using text messages and uh, internet and apps. So this became a, a, a very new way of delivering uh, healthcare when a lot of our facilities were closed or nearly closed. The third uh, innovation that came was the public facing dashboard, the corona.gov.bd. My apologies that it's in the local language because that was what was needed for the country. We did not actually translate this to English. Uh, so this allowed a one-stop shop for all, all corona-related information, COVID-related information, because there was a lot of misinformation, disinformation going around in the social media and also in general media. So this became the authentic source of information and that helped us uh, uh, control not only uh, the outbreak itself, but also the information outbreak that of disinformation. The fourth one I'll talk about is the socioeconomic recovery tracker. And this actually brought in a number, this was a uh, collaboration with UNICEF. And this brought in uh, uh, many different indicators across the entire country beyond just health. Uh, this is an example of how we were looking at uh, school closure, how it was affecting students and teachers. And this was done across specific districts and specific locations around the country. And we were able to do uh, electronic education, so distance education through TV, through the internet, based on uh, where the severity of uh, school closure was the, was the largest. The fifth one I'll talk about is the National Policy Dashboard, which uh, publishes every week uh, the corona spread information based on test positivity across the entire country. So as you will see, uh, the whole country became, this is, this is published by district, 64 districts across the country. The whole country became green for a short period of time. And now it started becoming, specific locations have started becoming orange and red, which basically means this is where the disease is spreading the fastest. And every week we have a, uh, on a Saturday, we have an analysis team uh, with public health experts and government officials. And we have a meeting uh, with specific districts, the head of health and head of uh, administration to understand how public health measures can be strengthened in those districts. So recently, again, I apologize for the, for the local language, but it's a comparison in the dashboard of how the general bed usage and the ICD, ICU bed usage is going up. So you'll see that here, ICU bed in the last uh, three weeks has been alarmingly going up to red, which basically means that uh, we are near full capacity right now. Uh, general beds, we still have a lot of uh, lot of capacity in the country. So uh, this is how we, we track across country and across districts. The sixth uh, best practice, I'll talk about the telehealth center, which came as a uh, byproduct of the triple three hotline that we had. So as uh, citizens were calling in with self uh, self reporting symptoms and started getting help from the 4000 plus doctors that we had we decided that we would have a proactive way of reaching out to all the covid positive patients so that's what we started in june of last year still continuing so we have served so far 600000 uh, patients uh, doctor consultations incoming and outgoing so that and this has also generated the country's first ever large electronic medical record system because we have a we had a system which we not, not did not really use but this actually practiced that that uh, so this uh, strengthened the electronic medical record uh, through covid information uh, alongside that with the ministry of uh, women and children affairs and uh, uh, director general of family planning we launched something called martelly health center for women and children. So this was also launched uh, in June of last year, still continuing. And this has become a central uh, public service delivery for uh, pregnant women and for a new uh, 
uh, the new new babies, so babies and infants. And this has this is now showing us the way of the future where we can look at uh, telemedicine as a way of doing public uh, service delivery for help. Uh, uh, and uh, we are also looking at because we have so much data available on uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, patients that we are now looking at possibility of creating a health financing out of this. The last one I'll talk about the vaccine rollout. And uh, this has been quite successful up until very recently, where I think uh, uh, the supply from India, which is what we depended on AstraZeneca, uh, India has, I think, recently decided uh, potentially not to export. So this has put us in a quandary. But uh, the data management system that we had for preparation of the 1,000 plus locations where we're doing vaccination, uh, the supply chain management, and any kind of adverse effect following immunization, AFI, and development of an international, internationally accepted vaccine certificate uh, by working with uh, India, uh, the US, and Estonia uh, is uh, actually going quite well. Uh, so the data management system has really helped us manage vaccine rollout in a very seamless manner. So what has been the key differentiator in all that different uh, uh, best practices or innovation that I talked about? It's really all about data. So data management uh, in an unprecedented way uh, for health and livelihood, I think really has helped us and in a way that uh, we have not looked at data before COVID, before from the government and also all the uh, partner development agencies. So that has really helped us contain the disease. Uh, so uh, strike the balance between life and livelihood. So, so far we've had about 577,000 infected, about 8.7 thousand deaths. But interestingly, uh, by managing uh, life and livelihood balance uh, using data, we also have been able to uh, sustain the GDP growth, which was about 8% pre-COVID, but we sustained it to about 5.2% last year, which was a remarkable achievement of the government. So in closing, I'll say that we took a five-pronged data approach for collective intelligence for improved policymaking. Uh, we broke the data silos, not only within government departments, but also between government and private sector. We developed intelligent data analytics that makes sense to the policymakers and not just to statisticians. We developed public, private, and academic partnerships uh, that allowed us to do very intelligent and rapid data analysis and also some predictive analysis for the future. We used a lot of modeling techniques that really helped us uh, with local and international academia. Uh, a lot of uh, academia from uh, the US and UK really helped us. Uh, we developed uh, data protection laws during this time, which we had not done before. So that really helped us use uh, uh, citizens' data in a, in a privacy protected manner. And South South Cooperation was a key differentiator in learning from other countries and also disseminating what we learned from Bangladesh to other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chauduri. Absolutely impressive presentation on the possibility and the use of. Um, technology taking again the opportunity of COVID to really make a huge step ahead, the use of data and not just collecting the data, but really applying for a very, um, very uh, intelligent way of addressing um, the pandemic. Thank you very much for this. Well, um, we unfortunately, and this probably um, shows I haven't been a good moderator, but we are a little bit behind, so we won't have time for Q&A. Um, but I want to thank everybody for this absolutely amazing session. And I want to uh, pass uh, the, the floor for conclusions and closing remarks to Ms. Anjali Sen, the UNFPA representative to Indonesia. Um, she... Um, um, she has also served as the agency representative to Yemen and prior to UNFPA, she served as a regional director at the International Planned Parenthood Federation and held several senior leadership positions in the Indian government. Uh, she's an Indian national who brings 30 years of experience in the development and government sectors. Much of her time has been spent in championing, championing and advocating the sexual reproductive health rights of the poorest, most vulnerable, and most marginalized communities. She holds a Master of History degree 
um, in the Jawaharlal Nehru uh, University and a Bachelor of uh, History degree from Delhi University. I'm very pleased that although we had a very wide representation a very interesting sessions um, during uh, this um, du uh, uh, interesting presentation during the session, I'm very pleased that we have another woman here to close uh, the session. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, um, Dr. Anjali Sen, the floor is yours for the closing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gary Eichmann. Uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished panelists, participants, colleagues, greetings from uh, Indonesia, where, yes, it is very much uh, late evening. Uh, it's really a, a huge uh, privilege to represent uh, UNFPA here uh, at this very critical discussions that we have just had on the role of South-South and technical cooperation. And we have heard these amazing experiences from all the, uh, the panelists. Uh, and uh, what we really see is uh, what is cutting across all of this is how good policy advice uh, had and how all the, the countries have really stepped up very quickly and adopted uh, strategic uh, approaches. And uh, they have quickly done impact on uh, essential health uh, services. They have developed, uh, like in Africa, continental strategies, whole of government approach, whole of society approach, and come up with strategies and adapted to continue with uh, essential uh, services and set up uh, important uh, and frameworks. And uh, this has really helped uh, in responding in a very strategic way to the emergency. And, uh, and also we've he heard examples from uh, Uruguay about how the leadership at the highest level really matters and bringing in all stakeholders in, in participating uh, and building credibility with best scientists working with uh, leadership. I think what also comes across uh, very clearly is uh, innovation, uh, which has uh, really driven all the countries in uh, developing their capacities. And we also hear, heard of uh, biomolecular techniques, AI, and uh, so really very, very innovative. And, and in the last presentation, of course, as you mentioned, really this whole collective intelligence and bringing in harnessing the power of uh, data, breaking down silos and really tapping into, uh, the, uh, into this. Uh, so innovations, and then I also noted uh, strategic partnerships, uh, uh, then communication strategies have been also very effective, looking at bringing in all the actors uh, and, and then being able to share that knowledge and having dialogues with civil society. And, uh, and all of this, uh, we, we heard about the experience of uh, Tunisia also in strengthening South-South cooperation, using communication technology to really reaching out to young people and organizing different ways of getting people uh, together and uh, really how they built resilience in this time of uh, crisis and reached out to the most uh, marginalized. And it was very interesting to hear from Thailand about the SSTC and the knowledge hub on public health and uh, their experience with maternal and child health and uh, universal health coverage and how they've really shared the response from the front line and, and uh, helped to uh, recover. And a lot of good practices around universal health uh, coverage. And as I mentioned, a whole of society, a whole of government approach, knowledge management, scaling up of um, uh, you know, solutions and uh, really thinking ahead. Uh, and I liked what uh, Dr. Chaudhary said in the end about a forward-looking citizen-centric approach. I think that that's also come through very uh, clearly in the key lessons that you talked about in uh, innovations in data and uh, public health and how you put all of that uh, together. Uh, so, so really, we've uh, learned a lot. And uh, all the countries have been sharing these uh, good experiences and all our director generals and experts from 
Africa CDC, Tunisia, Uruguay, Thailand, and Bangladesh. A real shout out to you for, uh, and, and this is really also a reminder to us that how mutual learning and cooperation is so essential to addressing all these global health issues, especially during this global health uh, crisis. And indeed, building forward better, I think uh, you mentioned that uh, Dr. Gary Eichmann and our executive director at UNFPA, Dr. Natalia Kanam, she also always talks about uh, building forward uh, better. Uh, so these uh, discussions are really helping us and these are starting points to collectively take uh, uh, strategic actions really to ensure universal access to life-saving essential health services uh, throughout the pandemic and of course going forward, forward as well. Uh, if you would uh, allow me to just talk briefly about uh, our UNFPA's experience in uh, uh, SSTC. Uh, for us, uh, this plays a, it's a very important role in our quest to achieve the International Conference on Population and Development, commonly known as ICBD Program of Action, and the Sustainable Development Goals by uh, 2030. And we have really institutionalized this as a cross-cutting programmatic and engagement approach uh, by integrating it into our uh, UNFPA strategic plan. And we've really worked at uh, inter-country cooperation, which has uh, brought results in addressing reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health, and gender equality, youth empowerment, and aging issues, as well as use of population data for national development uh, planning and implementation. Of course, we have seen now at the time of the pandemic that there are major barriers to our efforts to ensure universal access to uh, sexual and reproductive health information and services, and especially in achieving the SDGs, especially SDG 3 on good health and uh, well-being. And uh, because most of the resources are naturally focused on the pandemic at the cost sometimes, but we've seen it fantastic examples of how indeed these uh, essential services have been prioritized by uh, governments. Of course, we've seen an increase in vulnerabilities affecting those that are most marginalized and vulnerabilities have really shown up in a big way uh, at, at, in, the, in the pandemic. And we've also seen heightened uh, vulnerability to gender-based violence and on sexual and reproductive health issues. So UNFPA had a recent study uh, which estimated that 12 million women have experienced disruption in family planning services since the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And this is going to result in 1.4 million unintended uh, pregnancies. And uh, there was another big data analysis that uh, UNFPA and UN Women did earlier this month, which again has seen a considerable increase in the number of online searches on violence against uh, uh, women in eight uh, Asian countries, which included Indonesia, Thailand, and uh, Bangladesh. And uh, UNICEF has also recently warned of 10 million additional child marriages that may occur at the end of this decade, really threatening years of uh, progress. So, so given all of this, with these setbacks, we know how important this decade is uh, to deliver on the SDGs. And this is indeed going to be a, a, a challenge and of course, now with the vaccine, we have to focus on the vaccination rollout, which is presenting challenges, especially for the low and middle income uh, countries. Uh, so through our uh, sharing of our experiences from our uh, uh, you know, esteemed uh, panelists, we have seen how we can strengthen South-South and triangular cooperation by really looking at how we can integrate this into our strategic frameworks institutionally, collectively, at the national, regional, global levels, you know, uh, uh, enable mutual in-kind support of knowledge, skills, experience amongst countries. And this also helps in promoting, you know, cost effectiveness, efficiency in mobilizing resources, in, in advocacy, in vis visibility, building strategic partnerships, in delivering on, uh, on these important services and on uh, delivering on the uh, SDGs. And uh, also we can, this helps in leveraging uh, international consensus on critical and yet uh, sensitive uh, issues. Uh, so, and we've also seen how it, uh, this South-South can be very effective in, in the virtual space as well. 
as we heard a lot of examples about how uh, Thailand's knowledge hub is addressing maternal health and helping other countries with a lot of digital solutions and supporting capacity building, sharing of uh, experiences. And uh, we've also been working with partners and universities to organize uh, capacity building, online courses on comprehensive rights-based family planning, clinical family planning services, uh, et cetera. And uh, so virtual site visits, webinars, all of these can be envisaged uh, going forward during this uh, time. And, and as innovation and experiences of the panelists and the different countries have shown us that uh, we, we do not stop from continuing to work together to find innovative solutions. So there are always opportunities and we continue to learn and share our ex experiences uh, at this time when all these issues uh, have become so critical and important. So I just like to end with the principle of really leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest first and how we can indeed apply a human rights based approach within the context of uh, South South and triangular cooperation, and we can mutually support and collectively achieve both national and international development uh, priorities. And we can together, I believe, uh, uh, can ensure these life-saving essential health services uh, for those who need them most are available. And ultimately we can ensure that we can all deliver on the SDGs and make that a reality by uh, 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. San. Thank you very much, all speakers. Thank you very much to the audience, for everybody who's made this possible. And really, uh, I think we are taking this opportunity of a crisis to what we say, build better, build forward better. I think that's that's the language we're going to need. And, um, and, and this South-South cooperation uh, as an absolute opportunity for that. And so in name of UNOSC, UNFPA, UNICEF, PAHO WHO, hereby we have closed um, the session. Thank you very much.